Welcome everybody to the Scale Up Show. This is your host, Ryan Staley, and I have a very special guest with me today. I have Dimitri Adler. Dimitri is the co-founder of Data Society, which is a, an award-winning AI education and software engineering firm that serves the enterprise and public sectors. Some really cool things about Dimitri is he was an EY Entrepreneur of the Year finalist in 2021, one of Inc. 5000's fastest growing companies, and one of the top 10 ed tech companies identified by Forbes. Dimitri, welcome. Happy to have you on the show, man. Pleasure, uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I love the conversation we had before to kind of kick things off. But before we get too deep into your background history, where we're going, uh, let's do a real quick revenue rundown in terms of where you're at in the stage of the journey. So where are you guys at in terms of your ARR? Uh, we're about 10 million top line. Okay, cool. And then what's your primary revenue go-to-market strategy in terms of growing the business? You know, we're focused on the enterprise, so it's very much about customer service. And so uh, it's an account executive coverage model uh, where we focus on specific verticals, specific sectors, um, and we offer tailored solutions to, to those customers. So it's very much a relationship-based business. Okay. Excellent, man. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's my background in particular is on the revenue, or I should say the enterprise side. So very familiar with it. Which, which verticals are your, your key focus? Yeah, uh, we spend a lot of time in healthcare, uh, in professional services, in defense, and in finance. Okay, excellent. So let's keep moving along. Can you talk through your solution in like two or three sentences on what it does and who it serves? Yeah, so there are two sides to our business. About half of what we do is we provide uh, scaled workforce development solutions to both the Fortune 1000 and public sector customers. Um, in that practice area, we train our client staff on a variety of data analytic, data science, AI, ML skills, as well as software engineering. So we teach people how to build really cool analytic tools, really cool software. On the other side of our business, we build that software for our clients. So we build custom search engines, analytic, analytic tools, risk models, uh, data warehouses, uh, data visualization systems, and so on and so forth. Okay, excellent. I can imagine that's um, cool. We'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, so how large is your team right now? Uh, we're 60 folks. Okay, 60. And then are you bootstrapped or funded? Uh, we're bootstrapped. Okay, congrats, man. Making it to the 10 million mark bootstrapped is a, a big, big feat. And there's, I think, when I looked at the stat, I think it was like 0.004% of, of companies make it to that level. So. You're obviously doing nope. something right. Congrats on you. It's something you can pat yourself on the back. Most people don't know that, which is crazy. Like when I, when I uh, talk about that on the show. So congrats, man. When you put it that way, I feel much better. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard not to, man. I mean, it's, it's data, right? Which, which I'm sure relates to your business. So let's get into your background. Like, how did you get to this point? How did you create, you know, $10 million top line company? Would love to hear just the journey on, you know, where you started and how you made it happen. Yeah, absolutely. Well, like I didn't do it by myself, right? I have I have two co-founders, um, you know, and together with our team, we did it. We did it jointly. You know, we have a lot of folks that have been with us from the beginning, and so we're very proud of the retention that we've had uh, among our staff. And so, you know, it's the accomplishment of the entire team first and foremost. Um, and that actually speaks to how we grow. So, um, just like most businesses, customers come back when you do a good job when you deliver a really cool product, a really cool service, when you help move the needle for them. And it's the because of the great skills and the execution of our team that our clients keep coming back to us. Um, when we started originally, we wanted to help professionals work more efficiently. And so we were teaching skills like R and Python programming that would help automate mundane tasks, that would help increase the accuracy of analyses. As we help people save a ton of time, they said, oh, well, that was easier than I thought to learn. And wow, I can do so much more at work. And managers saw the impact and they said, oh, well, teach more. You know, can you also tackle this subject and this subject? And so the, you know, 250 course catalog we have today really grew organically. It was client driven. And because it was client driven, it also developed along very reasonable learning paths. And so we created an ontology of the key topics within the space of data analytics, AI and machine learning, and software engineering, 
we guide people through those pathways today. We help match up skills and therefore training programs to the job, the job functions for our customers. And they appreciate that type of consultative approach. And, you know, the software engineering part of our business really came out of our training work. So folks said, look, you, we love what you taught us. You really know what you're talking about. Can you help us build a really cool tool? And so over time, we built more and more different projects with most of the demand coming in the shape of uh, NLP type work. So today we do a lot of work with generative AI and building a variety of systems from different types of search engines to um, recommendation engines, chatbots, summarizers, and so on and so forth. So it's a huge area of need uh, across our customer base. Oh, yeah, man. It's going to be raging right now. Um, so like, that's a cool story. And so it, it sounds like you, you went from, you know, that, that education side, you transformed and then started creating, you know, basically enabling fulfillment, I guess, like, what was the timeline for that? Like, how long did it take you to make, make that, that crossover? Um, I would love to just hear that. Cause it's, it's a, the education first model is very interesting. And especially with the space that you're talking about. Um, so what, what was the timeline on that? Like, what were some of the challenges you ran into along the way? Yeah, well, you know, the first few years, we really stuck to education um, and um, iterated on the different business models and business structures and operating models for, for the education silo. Um, and it really wasn't until we were, you know, three, four years in that we really started to develop um, uh, platforms at scale. We did some of that work earlier on, but it really wasn't until, you know, sort of 20, 2017, 2018, that we were really building, building enterprise systems, systems for our clients. Um, it wasn't something that we originally, from the get-go, said, that's exactly what we're going to do. Uh, it grew organically. Um, and in my experience, that's what we've really loved um, doing. When we started, there were about 95, if memory serves, boot camps or professional training programs that were competing with us, right? Other, other uh, private firms. Uh, today, there's probably five left, including us. Shut and up. Really? Yeah, you know, and when we look at what has driven that, and most of them didn't, didn't go through an acquisition. Most of them ended up going out of business. And when I looked at what happened to those, you had folks who kind of had a thesis and really stuck to that thesis, despite what the market was telling them. And the market is very dynamic. Um, you know, I think it's rare to say, oh, this is exactly what's going to happen in 10 years and have that exact thing actually, actually work. I bet if you asked, you know, Bill Gates in, in 2005, is, is uh, the Microsoft suite going to be a SaaS product, you know, sort of a purely virtual subscription rather than sell right. mailing CDs? I don't know what he would have said. You know, certainly wouldn't have said, wouldn't have said that in 1995. So you kind of got to adapt with the market, with the market forces. And that's, and that's what we've done. We've gone, you know, we stuck to our guns in terms of what we're really good at. We found various incarnations of ways of driving value for our client base. And so being very sort of customer obsessed and listening to our customers and doing that well uh, is what's driven our success. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And especially with the space you're in, right? It evolves very rapidly and nuanced, I, I imagine. So like, do you have like an internal, some kind of uh, like structure or system then to get that customer feedback, you know, after they implement along the way for future projects? Like, how do you basically codify that so that it it's something that just becomes a part of the DNA of your organization? Yeah. Uh, processes, you know, you have a standard deck, a standard way that you kick off a project. You have a standard project management plan where you know what are the roles and specialties you're going to need for each line of work. And you have a customer survey at the end of every engagement. Now, we actually do pre and post uh, evaluations of our students at the beginning of every class. At the end of the class, you actually do an evaluation from, from, the, from the student side. So, you know, you do that. Um, uh, you do that regularly, but it's about creating templates and making sure that there's a checklist that folks follow. Uh, that makes it a part of your DNA and, and, and consistent delivery. Okay. 
And and what do you how do you tackle like because this is something else that that I've heard a lot of the old people starting a project or starting the education course or event but then not finishing it like is it is there something that you've done that works really well to enhance that that completion rate yeah yeah absolutely so um, when people talk about completion rates uh, you talk about either very long multi year programs or you talk about self-paced programs, right? So the challenge that folks have is most people don't do well when they have to stick to learning on their own. We're social animals. The vast majority of, of, of us humans are. And so you stick to something when you have a buddy, when you're doing it together with others. And especially if you're doing it together in a professional setting when where folks are gonna be leveraging that skill set to do something afterwards. You know, you're kind of saying, well, look, I want to keep up with every with all of my colleagues. And well, if they have the skill set and I don't, you know, what's going to happen to me? Right. So there's probably a little bit of fear in terms of sticking with a training program. Uh, but that's key. The fact that we're synchronous and the fact that we tailor a program to the use cases of our clients is what makes it actionable. And when it's actionable and you're doing it with others, you stick to it. Um, tough to accomplish in something that's sort of out of the box, non-customized and self-paced. Okay. Makes sense. So what do you, actually, let, let's shift gears a little bit because I don't want to go too deep into the learning aspect. You got a lot of good stuff to talk about on the AI side. So let's shift gears a little bit. Uh, I, I know you mentioned that there's numerous deployments in terms of chatbots and other kind of functional components of, of AI that you work on and create. How many deployments have you done in the AI space? Just out of curiosity. So you have like a jumping off point. How many deployments of platforms? could be platforms, it could be AI projects, anything. Cause I, I know you've been working on it for a while, so it'd be great to hear that. A, a lot, you know, look, we, <laughs> our team makes thousands of commits every month, you know, wow. to our code repo. So uh, a lot, you know, if you include everything in our portfolio across sort of a history of training and, and delivering custom software, um, it's too many to count. Um, okay. And so cool. and it gives us sort of a lot of, data points that are on bookshelf in terms of different industry specific applications. Well, let's talk through that. Let's, th let's take it like through the lens of kind of like two spaces, right? Um, one with, with everything that's happening in AI right now and the, the rapid <laughs> adoption, I should say at, at the consumer level, I guess, what do you think if we look at this through the lens of like, let's say you're starting a company right now, what's, if, you were there and you're starting a company right now, what would be your number one approach in terms of leveraging AI to, to build a strong foundation for the organization moving forward? Um, it's not about AI, it's about the problem, right? You have to make someone's life better in order to have a sustainable business. And you, know, you don't wanna kind of grab a hammer and just look for a bunch of nails, you gotta figure out where nails make sense. So just to flip it a little bit, um, in order, if you want to use uh, machine-driven automation, if you want to use AI, you have to have um, data that it can learn from and that it can utilize in order to tell you something, right? We use AI to either automatically do something by following a pattern or to make a recommendation based on a pattern that it learned from mm -hmm. in broad strokes with, you know, of course, some, some exceptions as you can uh, expect. So um, if your organization doesn't have a culture of acquiring data, of knowing how to store it, of understanding what's relevant, then you're going to be hard pressed to end up leveraging AI, right? Unless you're buying a pure sort of third party tool that's already been, uh, been pre-chewed and pre-baked for you. Uh, but I think the AI revolution and the data revolution is just that. It's very much about um, a culture of measurement a culture of critically looking at the facts, at collecting that information, and then using a computer to automate calculations to make decisions based, based on that information. I think that's, that's ultimately the key to success. I think the other key to success is what I would call AI literacy across the organization. Mm -hmm. um, the most dangerous thing about AI is when you don't understand what it's doing, because it can be, do some very powerful things. And... Um, you know, you can look at any number of loss from lawsuits to accidents about what happens when AI goes wrong. And so you really need to understand what, how does this tool work on a napkin? 
what is it looking at? How does it draw its conclusions? And be able to discern when that tool is safe to use and when it's not. And that's that orientation is what I call AI literacy. Okay. And so when it comes to that, and I, th I think that's a great point because not a lot of folks talk about that. <clears throat> you know, I think if someone's starting or let's say, I don't know, not someone's starting, some people have basic fundamental understanding of it. Like what, what, what's a framework or a process that you would recommend for developing AI lit literacy across an organization? A framework for developing AI literacy. Well, uh, you do want a body of information to be conveyed to the population, right? Um, we do courses on that, you know, call us and, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll do some unstructured like courses for you. But there's a variety of programs that help explain to people what is AI, how does it work, what are the components, um, what is it fundamentally doing under the hood, and what do I mean by that. You don't need to understand calculus to understand what AI is doing. That's not the intent. The intent goes kind of like this. If you're looking to measure the similarity of documents and therefore say which documents are similar to this document, what the AI is basically going to be doing is it's going to be um, looking at the frequency of occurrence of certain words and their co occurrence. Um, and so when you understand that that's what's happening under the hood, then you can understand um, how you can deploy something like that. So it's sort of a layperson's understanding. And so it's a having a set of questions that your staff knows that a machine can answer. What is something like? How much of something is going to happen? What are the different groups that exist within your data set? What is more likely to happen? What is the likelihood of something happening? So some of those canonical questions and being able to conceptualize an AI tool as answering one of those types of questions. And there's a handful of them. We don't have to cover it all on, on the uh, Okay. On this no, I, I think that's a good foundation right there. Yeah. So what do you see are the dangers with AI right now? Yeah, so one of the biggest dangers that I see is... AI is a really great impersonator. Um, and it's really great at learning from people and leveraging their biases, their preconceptions against them. When people can't discern what's real and what's not because of AI, uh, that starts to create a distortion of the world. And that starts to lead to bad decisions. So. You know, look at look at where we where we ended versus where we started. If the whole idea of data driven decision making originally was to help make better decisions, now that AI has become sort of indistinguishable from humans in many ways, uh, by humans in many ways, now it can actually lead you to make the wrong decisions, to believe things that aren't actually true. Uh, I think that's that that that's a huge danger. Um, you know, I think. There's no sort of danger of, well, some sentient, sentient Skynet is going to take over and rule us all. Uh, I think we're pretty far away from that level of te uh, technological auton autonomy, um, but more um, deceiving people and getting people to act um, in, in certain ways. I think, I think that's the real danger. Um, I think... When you look at what's happened in the realm of digital media, and I'm saying digital media intentionally, it's not just your social channels. Um, what AI has been able to do is basically codify our behavior. We think that we are complex creatures with the ability to think complex thoughts. And while that may be true, a computer can actually make trillions of those calculations and find the patterns in our behavior. And therefore, what seems complicated to us becomes obvious and trivial to a computer. And so a computer can then start to shape us in that virtual cycle. Um, and that equally starts to become dangerous uh, unless we are able to say to the computer, you know, you're not my master, I'm your master, and I'm going to be able to use you. But you, on the one hand, need human understanding of how it works. And on the other hand, just like with any product, 
you need safeguards that are very thoughtful about limiting what the technology can do, much like a chip on a car that limits its top speed, right? Same principle, if you will. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that makes sense. Uh, and, you know, this kind of brings me down the path of like Jeffrey Hinton, uh, you know, from who's formerly at Google, resigned. I mean, what's your take on on him? Because he's got a deep understanding of it. He didn't, it sounds like based on what he was looking at, uh, he got freaked out when when AI passed the Turing test and that kind of started to change his viewpoint of, of the direction he thought the world is going with AGI. And so I guess what's your thought a little bit more forward looking with that versus misinformation, like kind of on the short term is, is what I hear you saying. Um, I have to confess that I haven't seen the movie Oppenheimer yet, but what I know about it is that I believe that Robert Oppenheimer was horrified by his own creation. I think you can see some of that in Jeff Hinton. Um, now, what I'll tell you from, you know, a lot of in-depth conversation with some very senior military officers is that no weapon in the grand context of history over time has prevented more wars and has saved more lives than the bomb. Mm-hmm. Uh, acting as a deterrent to physical violence due to mutual destruction. And so the ultimate benefit of the bomb, while maybe debatable, has certainly been great in the context of the sheer lives saved over time. Um, now, you tell that to anybody who's personally su- suffered the adverse effect of radiation or the bomb or has experienced nuclear explosion, and they can tell you just what that's like. I think AI is uh, not that dissimilar. I think in aggregate, AI has the potential to do tremendous good for human, for humans, increase efficiency of resources, um, give us a lot more resources to alleviate, you know, poverty, improve living standards across the globe, and so on and so forth. However, are there going to be people that are scammed by AI that pretends to be their child in distress? Yes. And you need regulations around that. We have regulations around nuclear weapons and non-proliferation. It's not like anybody can get a nuke, right? Right. Well, if you admit to yourself that AI has a similar level of power, then you have to have a similar level of guardrails on it. And I think what Jeff Hinton probably saw is that he appreciated the power of AI, much like the power of a nuclear weapon, but realized that so few people understand it just because it doesn't in and of itself go boom. Right. And realize that with the lack of guardrails in the short run, uh, you are liable to cause some real havoc. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, here's what I would say. And and, uh, it's interesting because this is a cross section, a little bit of what you do, right? But in the education space, I mean, I have kids that are, you know, in grammar school, right? And middle school. And like, I I think... (laughs) Just from what I'm hearing about schools, there's no policies around it. Policies are inconsistent. Like it's, there's going to be some, some, I think, big things in the education space that happen specifically as relates to our kids coming up with teachers and everything. So it's interesting to see how that's going to shake out. Any thoughts on that at all? So my kid's 11 months old. Going to actually be, actually, he's going to be a year next week. So, wow. Congrats. Um, so I thought about that question. How, how is all that going to shake out? I think that the skills that you're going to need to operate effectively in the world of AI, where a lot of the th- actions of the old are simplified, are going to be fundamentally different. And I think that our current education, skill, uh, education system is incredibly poorly equipped to do that, right? So the curriculum structure, yeah, and yes, I know the curriculum specifically changes year to year, and now we do math differently, and so on and so forth, and you know history changes over time, and so. On. But the underlying structure of the curriculum, where everybody learns how to write and how to write in cursive, and so on and so forth, that has been in place for a hundred years, right, since the industrial revolution. And given that AI is sort of the next type of industrial revolution, the education system needs to adapt and evolve. It's never been easier to start a business, for example. And I think there's something like 7 million small businesses in the United States with um, thousands started every year. Which high school's got a good, you know, how to start your own business class? You know, I don't know. I haven't seen them, right? I haven't seen them. So 
thinking about the types of decisions that you have to be able to make. If AI is automating your calculus for you, okay, well, you really have to understand how to make decisions around using calculus. So your problem solving skills have to be different and have to evolve. Um, and I, I think there's a lack of appreciation uh, in the academic community of what is that next set of skills that folks are going to need to be effective, productive adults. I'll tell you that, you know, the older I get, the, the more experience I have, the less relevance conventional education starts to have, right? The oh, less impact it has on my day-to-day -day life. And I'm sure, you know, most of, of uh, our listeners would agree to that. So you need to have an education system that gives kids from the get-go the skill sets to be successful such that, you know, Peter Thiel's offer of, hey, drop out of high school, I'll give you a hundred grand to build a company sounds less enticing, right? Um, you know, you want to ideally have an education system where his argument doesn't make sense. Whereas today, I think in many cases, it's hard to argue with. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's crazy, I guess. So what do you think the next set of skills that are needed then really for kind of what's coming and um, what's happening? I mean, where, where do you see the opportunity or the need? Yeah. So I think teaching kids a very rigorous thought process, a very rigorous problem solving process is absolutely critical. People in a way, in a world where we can measure everything and use those measurements to do stuff, I think everybody needs to know how to think like a scientist, at least a little bit. Um, so uh, I'm not going to tell you that I've got a curriculum for K through 12. I'm in no shape or form an education expert or a childhood development expert, uh, at least not in that sense. But um, I want to make sure that kids have the ability to think better. Um, you know, and I think the education system itself should actually lend itself to more flexibility. You had a system that was very rigid because of lack of customization ability. Well, what if you can use the technology to make curricula more flexible? Um, give people the ability to learn on their own faster in a variety of avenues and not keep everybody, you know, to the exact same identical schedule. Yeah. I think, you know, that kind of approach is going to be helpful. Um, I think some skills are still necessary, like reading, writing, you know, math. Uh, of course, of course, all that's going to be necessary. But the historical stressors of memorization as a skill set, I think over time are going to become less important. And yeah. the ability to find a way to apply uh, different tools in novel ways is going to grow in significance. Yeah. I agree. I definitely see that. Uh, it's just interesting. I mean, like the reason why this is on my mind, A, I heard a podcast talking about this morning. B, I was on a school board before. And uh, it's it's interesting to see how, how far schools lag when it comes to things like this. Uh, so anyways, we're getting close on time, Dimitri. So one of the things I wanted to ask you too, before we, we kind of left is like, Sounds like you, you've had great success growing the company. You've been very, very like attached to the customer in terms of understanding what their next need is based on you know the feedback and the processes and systems you have in place. What would you say like after you know being a mature company and where you're at in the stages of the journey you're at now? What's the single biggest challenge that you have in growing the business right now? I think that there's a great book called Only the Paranoid Survive. <laughs> and I think that's very true. Um, Jeff Bezos was once asked, you know, Jeff, what, what has changed, you know, in Amazon when you went from like, this is day one, it's all hands on deck to, oh, you know, this is day three. And he just looked at the interviewer and said, no, you're wrong. Every day is day one, right? <laughs> and I think that's very much true. I think what you can never assume as, um, any kind of business uh, owner, leader, driver, manager is that what's been true in the past is going to be true in the future. You have to be very careful about thinking uh, what's next. Um, what's next? How, is, how are market conditions changing? How is the technological landscape changing? Are your services going to be relevant next year, right? That's not a guarantee. Uh, the AI revolution that we've been talking about is going to transform every single company, right? We started um, 
streamlining and automating our content development years ago, but right now we're going to be doing that so much more. And I think if you're in the business of content generation uh, and sort of selling that information, if you're not finding ways to leverage generative AI in your process, well, you know, you're going to be competed out of existence before too long. Yeah. So um, I think there's no particular pain point that's harder than others, aside from the fact that you don't start a business once. I see it as you start a business every day and it's what you do today that's going to determine your success in a year or two. Excellent, man. Well, that's a great, great note to end on it. I love the future looking approach and, and I'm going to have to check out that book. I have not read that book. Only the paranoid survive. Where can people find you? Where can they find out more about data society and, and which guys are doing? And then we'll wrap it up. Yeah. Uh, well, come check us out at datasociety.com uh, or email us at hello at datasociety.com. And uh, we'd, love to, we'd love to talk to you about your uh, technology needs. Excellent, man. Well, Dimitri, it was a pleasure having you on the show. I love your perspective. Very thoughtful. Uh, very, I can tell you've thought deeply about a lot of these things that, that we talked about on the show today. So really appreciated hearing your thoughts. And uh, thanks for being on, man. Thanks for having me. All right. And thank you for listening as well. We will see you on the next episode. All right.